Good morning, uh, brothers and sisters in Christ. Today is our midweek service, Wednesday service, and we want to thank God for giving us also the opportunity to prepare this service for you. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for the history of Israel and the lessons that we can learn from the mistakes they made. Keep us from criticizing them for their failure. But may their disappoint prompt us to listen to your voice, obey your commands, and in all things to do your will, to your praise and glory. This I ask in the name of Jesus. Amen. I would ask my brother Ben to come and do the reading of the word of God uh, from the book of Judges, chapter 4, verses 1 to 24. Thank you, Brother Ben. Morning, everyone. I hope you're having a great week, uh, that your Wednesday is uh, filled with joy from the Lord. Uh, it's just so good to be able to come before you and uh, read the Word of God. It's uh, a real blessing, and I just thank God for this every day. Uh, as Johnson mentioned, Judges 4, 1 to 24. And it's about the third period of Deborah and Barak. And that's Deborah. Again, the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord, now that Ehud was dead. So the Lord sold them into the hands of Jabin, king of Canaan, who reigned in Hazor. Caesarea, the, uh, Caesarea, the commander of his army, was based in Harasheth, Haggayim, because he had 900 chariots fitted with iron and had cruelly oppressed the Israelites for 20 years, they cried to the Lord for help. Now Deborah, a prophet, the wife of Lipidiath, was leading Israel at that time. She held court under the palm of Deborah between Ramah and Bethel in the hill country of Ephraim. And the Israelites went up to her to have her dispute dis, uh, decide, de, their disputes decided. She sent for Barak, son of Abednoam, from Kadesh in Naphtali, and said to him, The Lord, the God of Israel, commands you, Go take with you ten thousand men from Naphtali and Zebulun, and lead them up to Mount Tabor. I will lead Caesarea, Caesarea, the commander of Jabin's army, with his chariots and his troops to the Kishon River and give him into your hands. Barak said to her, If you go with me, I will go. But if you don't go with me, I won't go. Certainly I will go with you, said Deborah. But because of the courts you are taking, the honour will not be yours, for the Lord will deliver deliver Caesarea into the hands of a woman. So Deborah went with Barak to Kadesh. Then Barak summoned Zebulun and Naphtali, and 10,000 men went up under his command. Deborah also went with him. Now Heber the Canaanite had left with the other Kenites, sorry, the descendants of Hoab, Moses' brother-in-law, and pitched his tent by the great tree in Zanims near Kadesh. When they told Caesarea the, and that Barak, son of Abinoam, had gone up to Mount Tabor, Caesarea summoned the Harosheths, Haganim, to the Kishon Valley, all his men and 900 chariots fitted with iron. Then Deborah said to Barak, Go, this is the day the Lord has given Caesarea into your hands. Has not the Lord gone ahead of you? So Barak went down to Mount Tabor with 10,000 men following. At Barak's advance, the Lord routed Caesarea and all his chariots and army by the sword, and Caesarea got down off his chariots and fled on foot. Barak pursued the chariots and army as far as Harasheth Hagayim, and all Caesarea's troops fell by the sword. Not a man was left. 
Caesarea, meanwhile, fled on foot to the tent of Jael, the wife of Heber the Canaanite, because there was an alliance between Jabin king of Hazor and the family of Heber the Canaanite. Jael went out to meet Caesarea and said to him, Come, my lord, come right in. Don't be afraid. So, she en so he entered the tent and she covered him with a blanket. I'm thirsty, he said. Please give me some water. She opened a skin of milk, gave him a drink and covered him up. Stand in the doorway of the tent, he told her. If someone comes by and asks you, is anyone in there, say no. But Jael, Haber's wife, picked up a great tent peg and a hammer and went quietly to him when he lay fast asleep, exhausted. She drove the peg through his temple into the ground and he died. Just then, Barak came by in pursuit of Caesarea and Jael went out to meet him. Come, she said, I will show you the man you are looking for. So he went in with her and there lay Caesarea with the tent peg through his temple dead. On that day God subdued Jabin king of Canaan between the, before the Israelites and the hand of the Israelites pressed harder and harder against Jabin king of the Canaan until they destroyed him. And there was uh, many amazing names in there <laughs> but yeah we'll get the message so we'll get Johnson back up here to share this week's message for us and uh, can't wait. God bless you this week. Morning once again. I'm going to share with you on the theme reversal and victory. Reversal and victory. When God is going to do something wonderful, author Anne Lamott claims God is always touched with a hardship. When God is going to do something amazing, God starts with an impossibility. All of those ingredients are present in our lesson from the book of Judges. The people experiencing a crisis, a time of great stress, thinking, doom was all about inevitable. The situation appeared hopeless and impossible until God raised up the right person to meet the right challenge ahead of him. Time and again, the ancient Israelites failed when they turned their backs against God. We see this pattern repeated and through all the books of Joshua and Judges. So the people of old just did not seem to get it succumbing to the same mistakes over and over again. As our lesson opens, we find that the Israelites again did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. We might ask why were the people doing what they knew was wrong? Why were they so susceptible to sin? Were the people of dense that they just did not understand that there were always consequences to our sins? God has done so much for the people leading them into the promised land. And the people repaid God by repeating, repeated doing what was evil in the sight of the Lord. So the natural attendance of us to frown upon the ancient Israelites will keep failing into the same tra old trap. It is easy to see the pattern when we look back. However, it is more difficult to realize the problem when we are in the midst of troubling situation. While we may not want to admit it, there are times when we too fail the Lord and do what is evil in God's sight. We may have the best intentions, but for some reason we sometimes fall short of what God requires from us. Sisera was the man responsible for bringing stress and uncertainty. He had assembled quite a number army, including seemingly invincible 900 chariots of iron. Sisera had oppressed the Israelites cruelty for 20 years. Think about 20 years. It was a time of crisis of uncertainty, which apparently brought out the waste in the people. Imagine for a moment what it must have felt like. Waking up every morning knowing that a large arm was waiting to attack you. Apparently, this stress led the people to do what was wrong in the sight of God. It might have been nothing more than a convenient excuse for sinning. So the people did what was evil and then cried out for divine help. 
That was their turning point. And God in turn responded. Have you ever noticed that God is a way of choosing people that we might never pick? Throughout the pages of the Bible, we have discovered that God never called the qualified, but rather qualified the called. God knew exactly what, or in this case, who was needed at any given moment. Deborah was a judge in this time before the monarch was established. She was the first woman judge. Her task was to settle disputes for the people. And most days, Deborah could be found under a palm tree. In the hill country, it was there that the Israelites came for her judgment. So the cultural morals of the time prohibited women from meeting with men indoors. So Deborah had to move her office out under a palm tree to conduct business. Deborah was also a prophet transmitting the word of God. She held a unique position as both judge and prophet. So they trusted her to give them wise counsel. So apparently they sought her out to help find their way. In fact, the place where people met her eventually came to be her name. The place was called Deborah. So the real name, we don't know the real name of her. Deborah's palm tree stood out as the place where people could find her if they wanted to draw from the deep well of her wisdom. Over time, her wisdom produced for her a fair amount of credibility. But her work with God natured courage in her. She was so courageous that she didn't hesitate to consider the reality that God may speak to her. Out of a great love for God, Deborah was driven to what was pleasing in God's sight. There is no telling how God might use our lives when we open our lives to God. When we pray the Lord's Prayer, we pray, Thy will be done. Meaning we are opening our lives to God so that God can use us. The problem is that frequently we insist on doing things our own way. And when we do, we close ourselves off to God. So Deborah's desire was to please God and allow God to use her in a mighty way. People respected this independent-minded, spirit-filled woman who spoke the word of the Lord. The ranking military commander of the time was a man named Barak. Evidently, Barak did not have a problem with a woman judge or who takes orders from one. For he went immediately to see Deborah after she had sent for him. So Deborah instructed him, the Lord, the God of Israel, commands you. Go take position at Mount Tabor. Bring 10,000 from the tribe of Naphtali and the tribe of Zelabah. The Lord God was about to act once upon on behalf of the Lord. God was clear in control of the situation. So Deborah explained how God would draw out the enemy Cicero and promised, I will give him into your hand. So God promised to lure Sisera into a ravine thus giving the victory to the Israelites. So with such clear direction and promise of victory, one might have thought that Barak would set out without hesitation. And perhaps he might have. However, he had one request with, for Deborah. He asked that she accompany him and the troops. This was an unusual request. Some have suggested that maybe Barak was weak or unsure of himself. Others have maintained that Deborah's charismatic personality would inspire the soldiers in battle. Or maybe Barak was simply testing a commitment since she is the one who came with the prophecy. Without faltering, Deborah agreed to go with him, assuring him of the victory. But nothing that would come at the hand of another woman, jail. So much for Barak's male ego. Deborah was not afraid to lead by example. She teaches us that leaders should be on the forefront, getting their hands dead, not secluded in a safe location. Her love and trust of God was so great that she was willing to place her life on the line when needed. So Deborah's praises, despite the soldiers and the victory, played out exactly as she had foretold. So the menacing enemy was soundly defeated. Deborah composed a saying, a hymn, 
telling of his significant victory that is found in the next chapter in Judges chapter 5. It is a poetic song of celebration commemorating the victory in rather graphic detail. Deborah, the Israelite's first woman judge, remained in a position for 40 years and according to the scriptures, they landed rest for 40 years when she was the judge. So Deborah accomplished the seemingly impossible thing. God has an uncanny way of choosing the right person at the right time to bring about God's desires. When we surrender our lives to God, we'll find both meaning and purpose. God doesn't call us to sit on the sidelines and watch. He calls us to be on the field playing the games. He doesn't call us to be spectators. So this remarkable god filled woman accomplished these things at a time when many people thought a woman had no business doing such things. For one thing, she happened to be a woman. In those days, being a woman gave her only a slight advantage over being a cow or a donkey. In fact, cows and donkeys may have mattered more than a woman in some of the homes back then. God is at work in our lives and in our world, working with ordinary people to accomplish the seemingly impossible. God is at work even at those times when we are unaware of God's presence. If only we knew in times of uncertainty which direction we should take. Unfortunately, we do not always know. But we do know that God is with us. God is an uncanny way of calling people who do never expect through these people, God's plan is always accomplished. He calls simple people, ordinary people. God does not call the qualified, but rather qualifies the called. The book of Judges challenges our stereotypes and reverses our expectations. Our Lord Jesus calls us to follow him. At times, we may not have a clear sense of where we are going, but we follow trusting the Lord to show us the right way. We follow knowing that there are times when we have to step out in our faith into the unknown. We do so knowing that we do not go alone. Amen to that church. We move with God. We don't need to charge, to charge the barricades in our lives or by ourselves. Today's text from the Old Testament offers similar advice on how to overcome one's enemies. When we think about a biblical story where the apparently weak underdog conquers the lunch, well-armed enemy, everyone usually comes up with the favorite standard, David and Goliath. Those are the stories we think of. But the story of Deborah, Barak, Jael defeating Caesarea and used huge arm of chariots designed to chew up enemy is real another David and Goliath story. Only in this version, the female lead the key to victory over the oppressors found in a teamwork. It's women doing the job. Whereas David's confrontation with the large than life Goliath was one man show. The defeat of Caesarea soldiers and the release of Jabin, strange world, comes about through the supportive cooperative efforts of Deborah, Barak, and Jael. So David's victory brought an end to the fear of giant Goliath. They are driven into the hands of Israel's soldiers. By the triumph of Deborah, Barak and Jael brought about the destruction of all those who had orchestrated Israel's oppression. So together they de defeated Jabin and Sisera's military. Mighty set all Israel free. Israel was free at last. Sometimes it only takes one problem, one barrier, to prevent us from claiming or keeping the promised land in our sight. The Lord has intended us to inhabit. Whatever the problem in your life, it is your own personal Goliath. Whatever problem you have, it is your own personal Goliath. This Goliath could be a co-worker you simply cannot get along with and let undermine your productivity at work. This Goliath could be your addiction to drugs. This Goliath could be your addiction to alcohol, gambling, or sex. Your Goliath could be the inability to make decisions. It, take, it only takes one problem, one impediment, to keep us at arm's length from God's plans for us. With so much at stake, is there any doubt that, like David slowly swinging his sling and taking aim, 
we must put all of our strength towards knocking down this enemy. So the problem is that while our road may be blocked at one point, it is far more likely that the way is cut off by Cicero, see 900 chariots than one single giant warrior. Our biggest barrier to be fulfilled life God would offer us may be something like insecurity, mistrust, and depression. So the answer comes from today's lesson. A strong, seemingly overwhelming enemy can only be defeated through one technique, teamwork. We don't need to battle the barricades in our lives by ourselves. We have a community of faith beside us, a cloud of witness behind us to help us move forward. If only we listen to the voices and let them help us. So the story of the victory of that Deborah, Barak, and Jehovah recounted for Israel demonstrates that there may be all types of people who will be able to help us draw closer to our promised land. Israel's victory didn't come about through brutal strength. In fact, by using two women to bring about the end of the Canaanite operation over Israel, this takes its attention away from military might. So God's saving intentions come about because Barak listens to a woman who is acting as both a judge and a prophet for Israel. It is obedience to God's will, as spoken by Deborah. Not Israel's soldiers that give Barak his victory. It was a judge who raised only her voice, never a weapon, that Deborah guided the people over the Canaanite enemy. How many times do we mislabel weakness as strength and strength as weakness? What chariot army is trying to convince you that you are weak and helpless rather than strong? If you have power over people, this is one lesson we are learning. If you have power over people, use it wisely. Imitate God by directing your power to help people under your authority, not to hate them. If you use it to abuse powerless people, you have to realize that you will be held accountable for your actions. You may think that the powerless will have no recourse, but the Lord who loves them won't sit idle by for a long time. Just ask the Canaanites and they will tell you what happened. For 20 years, they've been oppressing the Israelites. But ask them what happened under the leadership of a woman, Deborah. If you find yourself to be powerless and living at the mess of others, remember that the Lord gives strength to the weak. Rest assured that no oppressor can stand against him. God will enable you to know his wisdom and to walk in his ways. Accordingly, God will work through and in you in ways that will surprise you. So turn to him and don't forget the question that the Apostle Paul raised in Romans 8.31. If God is for us, who would dare be against us? Don't forget the answer either. Nobody amen to that. If God is for us, who could be against us? Nobody. Nobody. Because God is always there. He is the God who brings victory where we see failure. He is the God who goes with us where we are afraid. So never underestimate the power that is in you as a Christian. Because your God is alive. He lives. He's there for you. May God help you. As you think and listen to the message from Deborah, who is a judge and a prophetess, who is calling you to stand up and follow God's instruction. God bless you this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the main lessons that we can learn from the Old Testament, the New Testament, scriptures. 
Help us not to fraternize with the enemy of our souls, but to stand firm on the gospel of God. Thank you that in the power of the Spirit, we have all that we need for life and come forth as pure gold. When tested by the fear and circumstances of life, help us to keep our eyes on Jesus, not to be enticed by the seducive enemy of our souls, whose aim is to shipwreck our faith and destroy our testimonies. May we never be intimidated by the evil one, knowing that Christ has already won the victory and that greater is the one dwelling Holy Spirit that is in the world. Father, I ask you this in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, who is the Savior. Amen. Let us receive grace. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all from now and evermore. Amen.